Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits. And if you think there's a punchline that should go here, I don't know what it is. What shall we talk about today? How about love, passion and betrayal in a bookshop? Well, you're probably thinking, what's the old man on about now? Has he finally lost his biscuit tin? Well, actually, that's the strapline of a musical called Paper Hearts. And that's the show we're going to be discussing today. It's been around for a while. If you're an avid fan of the up-and-coming fringe musicals around London or Edinburgh, you may well have seen it, because it was a sold-out show at the Waterloo East Theatre a year or so ago, and I saw it when it came to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in 2016. I was very impressed by it, and was able to track down the assistant director of the show, from whom we're going to hear a little bit later. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit more about the show Paper Hearts. It's described as a new British musical, and it's written by Liam O'Rafferty. And, rather splendidly, on the day we broadcast this episode, it's about to start a run at the theatre in Highgate Village in London, known as Upstairs at the Gatehouse. And that's running from the 2nd of May to the 20th of May in 2017. And if you can't see it there, you might be able to catch it in Hamburg, because it goes on to the first stage venue, from the 30th of May until the 7th of June. So, although a short tour, it can certainly claim to be an international one. The production at Upstairs at the Gatehouse is directed by Tamsin Azevedo, and the musical director is Daniel Jarvis, who also did the arrangements. But what's it about, I hear you crying? Well, I'll tell you, so don't cry. In fact, I'll go one better and read you the blurb from the website. Set in a high street bookshop, aspiring writer Attica Smith lives avidly through his novel's characters until the arrival of the fastidious Lily Sprocket. With a contemporary pop folk score performed by a company of actor musicians, Paper Hearts is about passion and finding your place in the world among books. Now, I must say, it's a very unusual piece. I hadn't seen anything quite like it, and I was very quickly drawn into the story when I saw it in Edinburgh. It has a parallel plot line where the what's happening in the real world situation informs what's going on in the book that Attica Smith is writing, and yet at the same time those characters help re-inform his actions back in the real world. It's a very nice little bit of parallel going on there, and the songs are very enjoyable. In fact, if you want to hear a few of them in advance, you can do so by going to the Paper Hearts website, which is paperheartsmusical.com. The show itself won an array of five and four star reviews up in Edinburgh last year, and I have no reason to believe that the show will be any less good when it comes to Upstairs at the Gatehouse this month. So that's the setup, if you like. I've told you everything there is to know about the show at a basic level. But let's hear a lot more now about the creative input into that show with a recording that I made at last year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe with the show's then assistant director. Musical Talk My name is Mark Stuart Flynn and the show I'm involved in at the Edinburgh Fringe is Paper Hearts the Musical and I am currently the assistant director. Now, Paper Hearts the Musical is a tremendously successful musical. It's a very accomplished piece of work. I was delighted by it. It's levels of sophistication because it's a sort of multi-layered piece. So, just to start off with, do you care to just give us a very quick pricey of the story without giving anything away too much? The story is set in a bookshop in England. We don't specify where. And it's about a young man who's the manager of the bookshop and he's also an aspiring book writer. And he's writing a book and the bookshop gets into some financial difficulties and a large corporation come in to take over and he meets a girl and they fall deeply in love and while all this is going on then we have an alter world which is the book that he is writing which is set in Russia so we've kind of we've two storylines going on both love stories both couples in very different worlds and yet and yet 
the, one of the great things about the book is the, the way that the, if we say the bookshop is the real life, the way that the real life informs the book as it is being written by our hero, if you like, and that in turn allows those characters to come to life as he writes them, yes. and then what they do, if you like, reinforms real life, it seems to me. It seems to me that both of the worlds we're seeing inform each other backwards and forwards and of course that's also signified even more strongly by having the same actors mm. playing different parts in the piece and mm. so if you choose you can also draw parallels between um, who's being cast in what role if you like as in is, is his manager in the imagination the hero of the Russian story or is that just something else I, 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 these are the questions I, I know there's no answers mm. to them so what's the history of Paper Hearts? Because it's, it, it's, its Edinburgh iteration is extremely good, extremely sophisticated. So it doesn't, it feels to me like it must have had a little bit of um, buffing on the way, if you don't mind me saying. I think it, yeah, I think it has uh, had a lot of buffing. It started off originally about maybe nearly five years ago now, and a writer, Limo Rafferty, he just had inspiration one day. He was in his friend's bookshop, and they were sitting down for some event, and he said that he was just sitting in, in the bookshop, and he just kind of imagined the whole world around him come alive, you know, one of those yes. inspiring euphoric moments. And all the characters kind of popped in. He said, oh, wouldn't it be great to write a musical that's set in a bookshop? And then it just kind of progressed from there. Now, the script has gone through several rewrites and redrafts, you know, the first drafts of anything. Of course, yeah. Exactly, yeah. First drafts of anything are never, never yes. quite right. And yeah, so and then... You do see a few up here in Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, you definitely do. And then he got in contact with our director, Tanya, and she helped him then kind of shape the story a little bit more and develop it and kind of hone it in. So she acted as a dramaturg, essentially? Essentially, yes, yeah. And when did you come on board? I came on board, funny enough, I met Tanya last year at a producers and directors networking event in London. Which is what it was for then. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, by uh, a lovely man, Chris O'Grady, who, who um, hosted. And we just had a chat and we had mutual friends and we're similar ages and I'd never worked on a musical before. And so I was just asking if I could, you know, have, be of any assistance. And here I am. So what had you done previously? You're an assistant director, obviously a director. Yes. Um, in, in real life. But how does one get to be that? And as, I'm, I'm very interested to know how you've got to this path because you, you say that you are now, you know, this mm. is your first musical. I think that's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good first one to have. I, when I moved over here from Dublin, I was doing a master's in theatre directing and I quickly realised that the master's in directing would not get me anything. I have to make my own connections and, and contacts. So I started emailing around and talking to different directors and I eventually ended up working in the Old Vic. I did the Old Vic New Voices Festival with Caroline Byrne. Then I went on to the Bush Theatre and I worked on a new play with, by Tanya Ronder called Fuck the Polar Bears. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting, yeah. Uh, then I went to the Lyric Hammersmith with Sean Holmes to assist him. I got accepted onto the Young Vix Emerging Directors Programme as well. So that was that's kind of a whole year long thing where we do courses and we meet up and. Um, it's a good venue to be connected with, if I may say. They are, yeah, I've, I've been very, very fortunate. And I think that's all that I've done. <laughs> that's, that's plenty. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a good yeah, lot. Yeah. I'm still, you're a young man, if you don't mind me saying. But, Thank um, you. But you've never done a, a musical before. So when you came on board, did you. I suppose the obvious question is, how do you as a director who has done drama first yes. and not musicals, if you make that differentiation, you know, how did you approach this? Were, you, were there any challenges that you felt particularly big? Honestly, no. I think that musical theatre and straight theatre are very, very similar. I do too, as it happens, but people don't. All, that, all the, the main difference is that when you get to a heightened sense of emotion, that's when the song comes out. Yeah. And sometimes you really miss that in, in, in theatre. I mean, a lot of theatre now is actually using music and using things for those moments, but it's not a musical theatre, it's music drama or Playing drama with music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I agree with that, absolutely. Mm. Things are becoming much more cinematic as well. Definitely. Uh, so people are much more used to that. But funnily enough, I was talking only earlier today with a writer and he was making the observation that actually the advantage of turning something into a musical or making it a musical is that it allows clunkiness because sometimes a, a character does need to avoid, uh, does need to sort of explain who they are a little bit yes. and sometimes that can be done very badly whereas actually a song is a, 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 an accepted step change which nobody bats an eye at mm. and it's a really useful dramatic tool. Yeah because in, in our story we explain who Isaac is in one song Yes, and I don't know how we would have done that in a, in a straight play because it would have taken a lot more probably time to develop the story Exposition, get everyone to yeah, yeah and get or, everyone or to understand. 
which is also... It, it, yeah, like you have to read something before you go in. So yeah, we get that done very quickly in, in one song and it's very entertaining too. But I'm quite interested that you sort of joined the project, as it were, when it was already relatively developed. So yes. you, you would set the script, obviously, to read through. Mm. Um, what immediately leapt out of it from it to you? Honestly, it wasn't more so the script, it was more so I got sent the tracks of the songs, oh, right, okay. and the songs so drew just, me in. it's the score that brought you in. The score, yeah, yeah. The score really brought me in. Because we workshopped, even when we had the text finished, we actually workshopped it for four days in rehearsals with the actors, so a lot of things were then also readjusted and, and changed and developed too. And cause the thing that strikes me, you know, that, well, actually I'll ask you the question, how would you describe the score itself in terms of tone? and possibly even sort of genre, that can be said. It's a collective mix, I think. We don't stick to one genre, obviously, because we're going from modern day England yes. to 1940s Russia. So there's that... Well, um, the, the Second World War as well. Exactly, yeah. And more the, conflict than we might usually have. Right? Yes, so it's... I think there's kind of something for everyone in the musical, really. It's got a very strong folk feel, though. Although it's quite a, it's an, it's a fusion meal, isn't it? Because it there's, is. some, um, there's some good Jewish bits in it. And some mm. good sort of folky bits and Russian -y bits. I know there's a huge overlap in some of those areas already, mm. and that's obviously in the Russian piece. And as you say, there's a slightly more jazz feel, perhaps, but it's, it's in the contemporary parts, you would say, it's slightly more. Mm. But what it is, it's a very sophisticated... It, it, the score is a good reflector of the duality of the piece, it seems to me, because it seems to help delineate the characteristics of the environment we're in in each section. Definitely. Our, um, our MD, Dan Jarvis, he did a lot of work on that score helping Liam orchestrate and arrange and kind of develop it because it was written originally on just guitar. Oh, was it? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. That really? Because it? it's such a... Because it's a little orchestra now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Cello, two violins, piano, drums, bass guitar. Which in Edinburgh terms is actually very impressive. But it's got this mm. beautiful tone and sound across the whole thing. It's a very sophisticated score, I think. I remember it almost like a chamber piece. A quite a rich chamber piece, not bitty in any way, but very sort of rich, covering... I'm going to use glue, but when I use the word glue, I don't mean in that kind of sort of blocking it up sense. I mean as in helping to contextualise mm. and recontextualise what we're seeing and delineate where we are, because actually it can be confusing in narrative terms, can it not? I mean, it's, there's such different locales, but even so, jumping from one to another could confuse an audience, has? It could, definitely, but I think we were very lucky with the actual musicians that we... Um, obtained in our, yeah, in our auditions because it could have definitely not been as well put together like we the music again workshopped a little bit so we added like we didn't know that one or we originally only had one um, violin player but then um, Maddie, Maddie Matthew Atkins who plays Isaac and Norman he is also a violin player. Because he and brings one on towards the end. He brings one on, yeah, he brings one on and kind of adds, it adds lovely layers in certain songs and just, again, the actors during the rehearsals, they themselves were offering suggestions and ideas and it well, was just a fantastic. The joy of the collaborative nature of art, it is. isn't it? Because yeah. It seems to me that actually when you're putting on a show, and particularly a musical, when you've got extra people that you might not have in a straight drama, I use the terms wrongly, but for shorthand, yes. you know, you will have orchestra, you will have extra people. Um, but you all have to forge that thing together, and if you can, if you're working, if you're looking in the same direction, you can bring things to the table which perhaps others haven't seen. Have you felt any need? Because you said there's there's been sort of dramaturgical support all the way through, but the director yes. also has a role in that sense. So, do you and the director working together? You know, have you seen any sort of grisly bits that you felt you've had to help smooth out, or you know, what's been the challenge for you? Really, I suppose. I don't want to say there hasn't been any challenges for me, <laughs> but it's been a very enjoyable process. Just certain, we've been working, like, even as we're going all the way through rehearsal process to, like, last week, we were still tweaking, and it's just things that we didn't feel sat right with us, yes. that we were just, we would talk. We had a very, we have a very good relationship, really good friendship, too, now, as well, and I could easily say anything to her about what I don't think was working or didn't really sit with me, and she could say the exact same thing. She, we, like, you know, we're just bouncing balls off each other, and... Yeah. Yes, in the nicest possible way, your lordship. Yes. Oh, <laughs> um, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to understand what it's saying. Um, how about the audience? Because people always forget that the audience is, you know, the, the final arbiter and actually plays a really important part in development. You know, once you've seen a show a few times sitting in front of an audience, the audience will have let you know what they think is good and what they don't think is good. Have you learned anything from what they're telling you? And is a fringe audience different from another audience, actually? Yes, they are different. Hmm. I think I have learned about our musical is that we're very well received by Asian people and by American people. Oh, 
Hmm, now that's interesting. Yes. Have you an answer for, as to why that might be? I think because we there's some. I think Americans, I'm, I'm making very big generalization yeah. here, so I probably shouldn't. It's purely from observation. From observation of this, they're, and they're, they kind of, they, they allow themselves to be more free in it and, and engage more and, you know, are more vocal. I think as a, a British uh, people, we're a lot more, we, we're inner laughers, you know, yes. we're inner, we, like a little snort and things like that. Um, but the Americans are very vocal and very engaging and there's lots more um, just activity in the audience that really feeds into our show. Also, musicals are like mother's milk to them, in a sense. You know, it's so much more part of their natural culture. Whereas, mm. actually, there is still kind of odd reluctance in this country, particularly amongst men, I must say. Mm. You know, people are dragged to musicals um, and sit there sulking because their girlfriend or whoever wants to see it. Um, very rarely will you find someone who's happy to stand up and say, I love musicals. You know, the, the, the traditional trope is, I don't really like musicals. So mm. people say, I think they're wrong, by the way. But, um, and I also think it's the fact that we are a British musical. Yeah. And we're, we're, you know, quite good. So I think the, Amer- I think. Thank you. Thank um, you. So I think they really enjoy something different, like something that's not, you know, the average uh, kind of American MT show. No, it isn't. Uh, yeah. uh, that's the other interesting thing about it. I think it's actually quite unlike most shows I've seen. You know, I've, I've been coming to the Fringe long enough now. And when, when you come to the Fringe, you see so many shows and you can afford to do so, you know, and, mm. and some will be rubbish and some will be good and some will be average. It's like real life. But um, you do start detecting trends um, and particular fads and fancies. And rather charmingly about this is it seems to me it's come fully formed to Edinburgh. I appreciate it's had its developmental stages, but it's not obviously hanging on the tails of many other shows. It's telling its own story. Yes. Uh, And it's telling its own story successfully at at that. Um, And it doesn't follow the traditional tropes of, you know, a jazz hands musical. It's not that kind. It's more of a chamber piece. I mean, I sort of rejected that a little bit earlier, but actually in terms of its subtlety, that seems to me more where it sits. How do, you, how do you see it in that sense? How do I see it in... Well, do you see it? Uh, it's, a, it's clearly a musical. Yes. But, you know, it doesn't follow the tradition. Do you, do you, are you able to peg it anywhere, or do you just see it as a completely new piece? As well? Which, of course, it is. It's an original piece. I yeah, I know what you mean. I don't know yet is where I would... to hang it on? I don't know if there is a hook to hang. Maybe if it's developed further, we get it into a two act, and then we can probably see more where it lies. Then, right now, as a one act musical theatre piece, I don't think I could really put it into any genre. I would say it's, it, it does have kind of similarities to Once and The Commitments, which are very, <laughs> two very different shows, but like there's kind of like that, that kind of energy and vibe from those shows in, in our show. One wonders, I think it works best in an intimate environment. I suspect if you put it in the London Palladium, it might be swamped rather. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> a lot of shows are swamped there, yeah, aren't indeed, they? Indeed, yes. Quite. Yeah. There are some nice narrative elements I like as well, because in the contemporary bookshop, you have Norman, as you say, who's your slightly older book owner, the bookshop owner. Yes. And then we have our hero, um, who's the, the author. Atticus. Atticus, yes. Atticus Smith, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, anyone who does read, or Atticus is such a weighted name because you just think of the, uh, the lawyer in To Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> which we reference yes yep. really, how could you know <laughs> I know yeah um, there aren't there many Atticuses around no there's are. not so you, you have a, your hero or the hero there and what I really liked was when we're in his novel he doesn't appear he is not he's not placed himself in his own novel no he hasn't and I suspect this is a question probably more for the author in some senses but you know forgive me that must have been a deliberate choice is that something you've discussed around the table at all with anyone? In the very early stages, he, I think the original idea was Atticus was going to play a split part as a Russian. Yeah. But then... Be the, yeah, in, the hero of his own book, as it were. Yeah. Maybe not even the hero. Protect. Maybe, maybe, no, maybe, maybe, oh, maybe someone else. Part. Yeah, maybe someone else. But I think then that through development, through talks, and through like you know the arc of the story, we realized, we realized that you know he would have to be more so the like the narrator kind of the mm. the story through him, not like him on both sides. It would be a big ask, wouldn't it? It would also be more confusing it would. as well because I, I once spoke to a director of a, actually it was a children's musical. It was Mr. Ben that had been turned into a musical very successfully. But I remember talking to the uh, the director about it, and he was saying that one of the when you have parts, shows with people playing multiple parts, you need one character who stays in his role or her yes. role all the way through as your kind of sort of lodestone around which all the others, otherwise it just becomes impossible to keep up with. Mm. And that's as true for children's drama as it is for adults' drama. 
So I think that's a very good choice because you would have to find someone else and that immediately throws the focus mm. of the piece somewhere else, isn't it? It does. But what's curious, and without giving anything away, is that in real life, the bookshop, Atticus has a very damaged relationship with his father, who's the big bad almost in a way. Whereas in the book, the actor who plays the father in contemporary life is also the big bad in the, he's the big Russian general, shall we say. But the person who's standing up to him is not the Atticus avatar. It is the hero of the book, but it's, he's portrayed by Norman the bookkeeper, yeah. the bookshop keeper. So mm. these are quite interesting because it's not as square cut a parallel as you might expect, although it's probably the stronger and more subtle for that. It is that relationship, you know, you don't, you don't see in the, in the real world, you don't see that Atticus and Norman are super super close you know there's a good relationship there but obviously Atticus really really cares about him and he's put him into the book in that sense as like you know a uh, to show like how much he does appreciate Norman and what Norman's done for him and uh, it's it's I mean maybe I was reading too much into it but I, Norman to me is played very gently and possibly as a gay man um, which also puts an interesting twist on whether that's a, he's a father substitute as well it's certainly mm. not a sexualised relationship they have at all. Not at all, It's, it's no, busy yeah. mates, actually, really, mm. isn't it? But there is an element of... Well, is it Norman taking the role of the father or is it Atticus imposing the role of the father on Norman? I think it's Norman being the father. Mm. I think so. Because if we see at the very end, before when they have their embrace, before yeah. he goes on to do the, the reading, that, um, that was the, that's the first sign of proper, like, you know, they show their connection. Well, he's, yeah, I mean, he's Atticus' his main support, isn't he? He is, yeah. I mean, Atticus is a, Atticus is a curious fellow, though. He's, um, he's, he's damaged. You can see he's damaged by his relationship with his father, and a little bit obsessive. And he's not afraid to sort of exile himself away from his own life, as it were. Mm. Um, and he does run away from problems as well, to a degree, doesn't he? He's also not very subtle on reading messages, it seems to me. And, uh, his relationship with... Alex. Yes. Yes. Is she, or is she not going to be a, a, a long-term female fixture in his life? So he's, you know, he's not, he's not your standard romantic hero. No. I mean, the actor is a very handsome man, and I know he had a lot of fans in the day I went to see him as well. He was pretty much roared to the ceiling outside. Were you the day that the American girls were there? I think I was. Okay, yes. Yeah. We had a good few groups of the American girls come in. They groups loved it. groupies, yes. Gro yeah, groupies, I think we developed. Yeah, I have, I have some videos of, of signing autographs afterwards. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> so funny to see. But it's, a, but it's a complicated character. You know, you, you sometimes is. in a uh, piece, not like this, but of, of a style like this, would be a relatively clear-cut hero with just one problem to resolve but actually you do get the impression that he's mm. quite complex mm. well I do you know he is yeah. a quite complex character and I think there's still moments there's still things that we probably need to finish off if we extend it a little bit so what are the prospects of the future I suppose that would be a very good question the prospects for the future are all very bright I can't say too much but no, we've had interest it. in we've had interest from people in Asia and people in in New York and we're just going to follow them up and develop so the show. There is, there's certainly hope that it might. Sort there of is certainly, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of hope. I wouldn't say that without actually truly believing it. So, yeah, I'm very pleased. Uh, what what has changed along the way since you've joined the joined the project? Because you would, you know, we were talking about ironing things out when the audience let you know bits and pieces. But you and you've just mentioned there there are things you might like to develop or bring forth. Mm. You know, if, if I'm just. Because it's so good, you know, it's, it, at one level it's hard to, you know, you, you don't want to say, well, actually, I could change this, because then the question is, well, why haven't you? Well, actually, because you're in production at the moment, and you are where you are, and it's changing subtly and organically, because everything does. And exactly, yeah. But there are always things you might want to do. There is, I'll give you one good example. The other night we all went back to, um, we have two apartments, yeah. and there's a, the ten actors are in one very big five-bedroom um, apartment, it's huge. And we were there one night, we had a, a nice family dinner after the show. Yeah. And we were just having a chat about how it went, and Gabby, who plays Lily, was just talking about her first line in Shame, how she doesn't feel it still hasn't like sat really well with her yet. Right. And then we started for about an hour all together, like different people trying to like figure out a, a new starting to give line to this, point, yeah. And yeah, and we, and, we, and, we, and we brainstorm and we figured it out. And yeah, we, we, I was singing along the whole way trying to think of different lines. And, and eventually, after about an hour and a half, we, we found something that we really, really liked. And now it's in the show. Oh, yeah. So you did actually. It was, yeah. It wasn't purely an intellectual exercise. It was actually no. a practical exercise. Absolutely, yeah. 
that's what I wonder. And it's actually, yeah, it really, I think now, like, watching the song, it makes a lot more sense to me now that why she is singing it. You see, and that's almost the best of collaboration then, isn't it? Absolutely, actually, yeah. You, you, you just, you just, she as the actress felt something, the audience presumably also will have helped that sense develop because if they don't know, then you, you can tell when an audience have lost their way. Yeah. And Lima Ryder is very good with that. Like, you know, he's very open to change, to collaboration. And it's, it's, it's obviously been very beneficial because, you know, we can work with some writers when I've worked with before yeah. and they're very, very close to the text and they won't want you, well, like, tweaking. I think you're tweaking. avoiding the word precious. I won't say precious, but, you know, they're, they're very close yes. to it. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, very nicely put, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's and, subtle, man. I see that. <laughs> and, you know, they don't want to have any changes. But Liam has been one of the um, best writers to work with in terms of openness and collaboration. Now, there's quite a lot of psychology in the piece. I mean, it, the central character's problem is with his father. That feeds into the book, as we were saying, i.e. the book he's writing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the relationship with his manager. There's the internal relationships of a romantic nature, both in real life, in the shop, and elsewhere. How do you, as a director, you know, forgive me, you've got to be real. But you've also got to allow things to happen that are out of the mundane in order to make a story develop. Because mm-hmm. it's not just a man writing a book. It's a man writing a book which then involves his real life and there's a, a reading competition. You know, there's, there's, in real life, you might think some of this was, a, you know, it's been concertinaed in to make a story, which was it might take two or three years and it's not that at all. But um, it's keeping the psychology real. How, how does one do that? Because this is a realistic piece, isn't it? Mm. Obviously, the actor is the most important person, but it's about all their, their intentions and knowing what they are doing and how they are developing as a character as the story progresses through the musical. So if we went in and we were taking it as very, like, you know, just matter of fact, like, oh, we're singing a song about not being very nice to someone and that's it. Like, you know, we, mm. we have to really see where the characters started from and how they develop. And there's a lot of there was a lot of like forensic um, examination in the in the rehearsal room at the very start where we looked into everyone's backstories properly. You know the same and this is what I've done in in straight theatre and and making sure that you know every intention, every objective, every nuanced decision that the character does. It it really then affects the piece and it makes what could be maybe lots of disjointed things really work well together organically. Organically. But I've got a question for you then, because mm. I have a specific question, because okay. the only thing that worried me slightly, and this is where you need to commit to me, is actually Atticus's former girlfriend. Because quite early on he's dumped yes. by a tremendously shallow woman, I must say, who seems to have no interest at all in the arts. But as he seems to be a man who has been immersed in the world of writing and books for some time, I'm not quite certain how they ever got together. I can understand how they've stopped, and I can understand her irritation with him. Mm. No, uh, because he does obsess about his book, doesn't he? He's, he's quite an obsessive character, actually. Yes. He won't let things go in many ways. He, he, he chews on the bone possibly slightly longer than is healthy for him intellectually or psychologically. But how do you, you know, forgive me, but this is a genuine question I've got. How did Atticus get with his odd first girlfriend? Uh, with Alex. I think he got with Alex because he met her out one night and she was very, very attractive. And he try to be a person that was suitable for her and you know and as the relationship progressed he got more and more comfortable being more himself again and I think also maybe his his book then t- kind of took over more mm. I don't think he was probably writing it very much at the start when he first met Alex and then that's it just sort of slowly, hinted, isn't it, in the yes text, yeah. because you know, yeah she remember how he used to be before yes. all the books and for all the writing so I think then um this then progressed during the Alex relationship we don't I haven't put a time frame on how long that relationship was for but yes, so it, um, he definitely wasn't like that at the start. He was trying to be the person for Alex. But, you know, as everyone knows, you, can't, you, can, you can pretend who you are for a while, but then, it, you know, it comes out. It was all about being yourself. Exactly. I mean, which is one of the messages of the piece, of course. I, I, was just, I was curious, because he's not a rich man, because he works in a bookshop, no. and he's made very plain that he hasn't got a lot of money. And she seems to be a woman who's um, expecting money spent on her. Mm. But also, you, you know, he's not flashy either. I suppose... Forgive me, I don't want to sound like I'm obsessing about this, but the actor is quite a handsome man, so I suppose if Atticus is a handsome man, that does go a long way if you're looking for a trophy boyfriend in that direction, and vice versa. Mm. Um, I, I, that was the only point I had any sort of, sort of semi, not concerns about, but I thought, ooh, I just don't see how he would have, you know, how a bookish man, a quiet, bookish, slightly obsessional man would have ended up with um, 
uh, flashy money grabbing. Yeah, that was definitely um, something that we worked on a little bit because you know it, it, it could seem untrue, and I think the works that that the um, that the actors did really did help. But again, because it's only a seventy-five minute piece, I think that we yes, wanted we wanted to get that in there because you know it's a kind of it's a fun sort of song. It's a it's a change up, and you know we see that because he has to be broken up with and kind of a little bit. Um, well, he ends up out of sorts for a moment, doesn't he? Uh, yes. He, he loses his way in his writing process. He does. And that's one of the contributing factors. And that's, and that's all kind of what that relationship is supposed to like, signify. So, but again, if we, if we, when we get more time, hopefully like, the, the character of Alex can be probably um, slightly more developed and the story can be seen fully. So, ideally, how long would it be? I, I, I do say the word ideally. Ideally. You know, are, we, are we talking a two-act, you know? I think so. Traditional, yes. yes, I think so. Now, I actually, in its form as it stands now, I enjoy it very much, but then when it comes to commercial touring or theatres yeah. wanting it, you know, most theatres want a two-act musical. You have to fit the norm, don't you? Absolutely. That is, and that's still, that's still something I think that we need to, like as the industry needs to work on, because, you know, I love going to plays that are yeah. one-acts, because you sit there and you're immersed in, you're not, you're not broken up from the story, and sometimes I feel like, you know, when it takes a while to get back into it again. Yeah, there's also, I must say, and it's a very sad thing to say, but there is a long tradition, which is a noted tradition, that Act 2 is very rarely as good as Act 1, which of course is avoided if you don't have an Act 2. Um, it's very difficult to sustain because so often Act 1 is such a beautiful story. I mean, Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim. Yes, I agree. Track, you know, Act 1 is so perfect. And then I you agree. think, well, what are you going to do with Act 2? Well, this is interesting and of course it's subtle and clever, but it's not quite as good. Um, you know, something is lost. Mm. So I do accept not everything expands up, although... Uh, this doesn't fall into this category at all. Conversely, you can do what Sandy Wilson did with The Boyfriend, which you can take that up from a one-act thing to a three-act 1920s-style musical piece. But because it's such gossamer, it doesn't matter that much, you know. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of filler in that, but it's such charming filler that nobody objects. This isn't at all filler. Every second counts here. It seems to Absolutely, be awesome yeah. So every, every second does count. We literally only have that like, small amount of time to get everything in. It's, is it a five minute in and a five minute out by any chance? No, we're actually very lucky because the act that is before us in our theatre finishes quite relatively early. They don't have a very large set. Oh, right. Um, they are uh, in an improvised musical. So they basically just clear out within like about 10 minutes. We have nearly a 40 minute get in. They impro tunes by you. Yes. Australian yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, saw that's their, them. I saw their musical about the giraffe and the duck. I haven't so seen. No, I haven't I, seen you, them yet. You, you but I will. Be busy preparing. Yes, quite. Yeah, <laughs> they all seem very jolly. But um, yes, you're right. They have. So you're lucky. You've got a little bit of wriggle room. We are, and then the the people that follow us, um, the thinking drinkers as well. <laughs> they they don't have a, a huge setup either, so they're quite good with us. Like you know, we we yeah. finish at five to eight, and we're usually out by quarter past because the get out's a lot quicker than the get in. Yeah. Oh, how long is the get in then? The get in is probably thirty five minutes because we have to do we have to do a sound check, we have to do tuning, we have to do vocal warm-up. Um. I mean, I think in Edinburgh terms, that's actually quite generous. Oh, it's very generous. Yeah, yeah we're very lucky. very lucky people. Yeah. We are. Yeah, Definitely. We're utilising the time well, though, so hopefully everyone always has enough time to... Because I feel like the fringe for lots of actors is a very... There's no time to get themselves in their right headspace beforehand, and it's, it's, it's a learning curve, for sure. You see people sure. in the street waiting with the crowd going in to see their own show. Yes. So you see... I was, I was in... I mean, it was just... Forgive me. Just the Mikado. And I say Justin Ricardo in no way, uh, in a pejorative sense, because it's a show like in it, it doesn't need to prove anything, it's been around for long enough. But I was standing in the queue to go and see the Mikado, because I'm a bit of a GNS fan, it's my sort of comfort blanket. Mm. And I was looking over and I thought, oh, those people are all going to be in the show, aren't they? And they were standing alongside us, because they were waiting to get in in the same way. That just doesn't happen in the West End, I imagine. No. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's definitely like, a, it really keeps actors on their toes yes. and creative team as well. <laughs> well, that's a very good question then. How do you keep the energy up over a, what is actually a massively exhausting run? Because you're here to the end, you have to fly air as well. You know, it's not simply rocking up for the show and seeing shows and lounging with truffles and uh, champagne like most actors do, ho-ho, in big speech marks, um, whilst they're waiting for their performances. You know, you start in the morning and you slog your way through to the end of the day and maybe after the show's over you've got a bit of chance to relax or have a, a big dinner and a chat over mm. a line. Actually, I love the fact that you all dine together. I think that's a really lovely sort of um, family atmosphere. I think that must really help cohere a group, doesn't it? It does, definitely yeah. does. Um, how do we keep the energy? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm actually working a lot of the time as a company manager too, as well as the assistant director. And we just talk. We, we're very open cast. We have a little chat every day before the get-in if there's any issues and things like that. I've been very, very um, understanding with them all. I know that their voices can get tired and their bodies are their, yeah. are their instruments. 
Um, so we've been just discussing things, making sure like to be um, fluid in our decisions, what we do. Like we don't have a very rigid, like you must do this every single day. We have to, we have to do certain commitments. But everyone gets along well. We chat. We always have a big group hug beforehand. And we sometimes play a little game of wah, this crazy kind of warm-up acting game. Very good. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we just we generally, as a group of people, get along well. And sometimes that is actually very rare when you're living with a lot of people in close proximity and you're working with them. You could be getting up other people's noses in that Absolutely. intimate environment, couldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah, and I suppose a good cohesive group does feed its own energy, though, doesn't it? I mean, you, you know, you, you actually take inspiration from each other rather mm. than have to come to it cold. Definitely, definitely. I'm a very positive person, yeah. so me as if when I'm, I always like to have a joke, and when, when we're doing the get in, I'll be shouting at them, I'll be telling them to put their clothes on and <laughs> having a laugh. So I think just always keep the keep the energy. I mean, we're very lucky to be doing what we're doing. And people on the whole want to be up rather than down anyway. Exactly, well, exactly. Yeah, we're very lucky. It can't hurt, however, to be attached to a successful show. Because people are being kind about it, aren't they? People are saying they are. positive things afterwards. No one's walking out, or at least nothing I saw. You know, how has the audience response been? Audience response? You, you said, obviously, a certain clientele, like the Americans and um, Asian audiences, are very much more keen. But, you know, you've been getting reviews. But yeah, and, generally. And everything's positive. I've not heard a negative thing about it. I've heard positives, but not negatives. Yeah, we've, been, we've been so lucky. For my first experience in The Fringe, I was yes. expecting something completely different. But no, the that audience numbers. Happen, by the way, <laughs> another day. If I come <laughs> yeah. back, I may just I may just leave it up as a high, and that's it. Stay stay in London then. Um, yeah, it, they've been fantastic. Everyone's been really positive. Like after the show, sometimes a lot of people are staying outside, and we're having yeah. conversations with them, and they're 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 very intrigued by the music, by the story. Like, will it be going somewhere else? It's I, flattering, isn't it? It is well? flattering, and I and I was really not that I, I believe in the show, but you still you know when you're working on something, you you develop a relationship with, and you and you begin to love it. But then, at the end of the day, you have to put it out to the audience and see, if, and they see if they love it too. And then it could be a completely different situation and experience if it wasn't getting as, as good reviews. And I, I really feel um, inspired by actors who come up here for a whole month and companies and, you know, they think the show is good because they worked on it, mm. but, you know, it's not doing very well and they get in very small audience, but they still do it, though. Well, you've got to, though, haven't you? You have to do it. But it's, I, I'm sure that, that, that makes people grow a lot as well. Yes, that's the benefit, I suppose. You are a very positive, oh, you are a very positive person, <laughs> I see that, but you're, fortunately you're not in that environment, so it, that must be nice. Um, mm. Are people being stopped in the street? I mean, are you fine because you're flying and things like that? Presumably people are saying, oh, I saw you last night, you were fab, or whatever. Yes, we do several performances a day on the three stages on the Golden Mile. I should just briefly explain, uh, the mile's got these... Oh, Royal Mile, I always call it the Golden Mile. We all call it both. Oh, yeah? yeah okay. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it, seems to be, it, seems, it seems to be an interchangeable term, but there are these... I don't know, they're about three metres by three metres or rolling stages. They're mini stages, aren't they? They are. And they're nicely paced, uh, so they're just far enough or just far enough away from each other that you don't swamp each other. Mm -hmm. And you get a 20-minute slot, is that essentially it? That's it. We do a medley of several songs in the show, all kind of the upbeat songs to yeah. get them... Get them in. Get the, get the audience yeah. Um, yeah, you don't want to start interested. with everyone's dying, isn't it? Horrible? No, it's exactly. Fine. But um, what I've noticed is, because I'm always kind of flowering and, and just walking around and seeing what people, how people are reacting... And we get more and more as the weeks have gone on. People who have seen the show coming back again just to watch just us, to just, to hear, just to hear, just to hear it recap. again. Because like I'll hand the flyer out to them, and they go, "We were there last night, or we were there last week. We just saw you guys. And we wanted to listen again." Now that's very promising as well. It is. Yeah, and even there was a group of girls um, last week who were singing along to the words of Paper Hearts. So they knew it. They knew it. Because that's came the closing to see, number, isn't it? That's the closing number. Yeah, so I think they came to it twice, maybe, and they already. Knew the Fans, melody. Groupies, yeah. Stalkers. It's been it, was really, it was really lovely to see, actually. So, actually, you just mentioned the upbeat songs in your medley. What are the songs in your medley? I'd just like to know what, you, what you've picked for your, um, you know, the, the morsels to drag people in. We start with Prologue, which is the introduction of Isaac and Yana. So you're in the book story? Yeah. yeah. We start with that. Then we go into Shame. And then we go into Paper Hearts. Three Which you've songs. Got to do in a way, I may be you? forgetting one right now because I just I hear it so much that I can't even remember it. But yeah, so I think it's Which three songs. It's now a mega mix anyway in your head, isn't it? It, it, <laughs> it is a mega mix. Yeah, but and um, we we've also altered all the harmonies and stuff so that's a, it's a group sound because some of those songs will have like solo aspects of it. But with um, the medley, we need to get as much volume out as possible. Need, and you're not allowed to use amplifiers, are you? On the sort of stages, I believe. You are actually. Oh, some people do, but we don't. We just oh, use our um, guitar and. Um, 
our uh, drummer brings his cajon. So I love the fact that you've got special publicity arrangements. Actually, I think that's, that's great foresight because you, you, you get the, the volume and the harmonies up and everything like that. Mm. We worked on that when we got up here, though. Yeah. Oh, oh, it was impromptu almost? Yes. Oh, yeah, we knew, no, we knew we were going to do it, oh, yeah, but, but um, it was, again, developed when we were up here, and, and then we changed it a bit. I was watching it. With the first, we had it in Stalingrad as well, one of the kind of more dramatic songs of the show, and as I was in the audience on the first day of the medleys, I just, that's what the second that song happened. Not that it's a bad song or anything, but it's a, it's a, it's a slower song. It's um, more about you need to listen to yeah. the... To the lyrics, it's a lyric and heavy song, isn't it? it is a lyric heavy song, and people were and they can't disengaging. Yeah, so we just tweaked that then. But it's good that you were spotting that because some people just stick with what they've done and think that will do, whereas you're responding mm. to the audience, and that, that's a sign of a well, it's a good sign of a good director, actually. Funnily enough, oh, I'm really pleased about that. Now, a couple of questions in. First of all, is there a recording of the score? That is being done as we speak. Splendid. But I am not sure for what purpose it's going to be for. I think it's more for producers right now. I don't think it's like a fully fledged recording. It'll be, it'll be of a good standard, yeah. but I don't think it'll be uh, released to the more public. More of a demo kind of a thing. Exactly, because you know, if, if people said they came to see the show and they enjoyed it, then we need to send them some sort of kind of information pack yeah. and if they want to hear it again and show other people. So that's what we're working on right now. But hopefully, in the future, there will definitely be a, a, a real recording. And websites, how can people find out about the show? Because there are people in this world who are, it's hard to believe, not here in Edinburgh. I know. <laughs> what are they thinking? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so how can people sort of get in contact with the show? We are on social media. We have a Twitter, we have an Instagram, and we have a Facebook. And it's all pe- hashtag Paper Hearts or at Paper Hearts Muzz, M-U-S. Short That's it for musical, musical yes, yeah, quite. And then our <laughs> website is... Paper Hearts Musical, I think, dot uk. I can't remember now. You could Google it and find Some, it. Yeah, if you, you just type in... We do. We yeah. definitely do, yeah. And there's a lot of information on the website and, and uh, Liam keeps it updated quite regularly. And people can contact the team through that. So there will be people out there listening thinking, do you know, I'd like to be in contact to find out when you're coming on. Or even, who knows, you know, maybe say, I have a venue. It'd be really lovely to have this come to my venue. Yes. So, so people can contact you. you absolutely, that. absolutely thought so perfect what next for you if you don't mind me asking next for me actually I'm going to work in arts ed in Chiswick in Chiswick yeah I'm going to assist on an, an old musical Lady Be Good by George Gershwin yes by jo- I was going to tell, I interrupt like, you and I then I'd like to talk to you in a minute <laughs> on, on <another laughs> and I'm working with a, a producer a, a director called John Brandt he's also a producer he's produced Memphis Oh yes. So he's done Memphis, Dream Girls, things like that, like really, really great. So I can't wait to yeah. work with him and, and learn hopefully some new things. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Good luck with how, how well do you know your Gershwin? Not very well, actually. Yeah, not very well. So it's going to be very interesting to go from Paper Hearts, which is you know yes. this one act, very different thing into it, like a very old, multi-layered. yeah, very you know old classic style of like a dance musical theatre two act show. Well, it'll be actually rather. In one sense, you'll be going back to the roots of musical theatre. Absolutely. Sense, you? Exactly, as you've said there. Because, mm. And that will, you've, at least if nothing else, you'll get the foundation stone from which almost everything else is built. Absolutely. Including the serious pieces like uh, Paper Hearts. Mm. Oh, I think you'll have a, a wow on that. Forgive well, me, I will make the date to come and see you for that. Oh, because, do, yes. Um, it's the third, it's the final year um, showcase for your agents is, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, the cast, we, we auditioned the cast back in in July. And I, 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 was, I was amazed by them. They're really talented kids in our head. Wally Watkins is the central character, isn't he? Wally, yeah. Um, is that right? Watty. Watty Watkins. Watty Watkins. Thank you very much indeed. I Watty saw and the lads. I saw play him years ago, brilliantly, at the Open Air Theatre in Regent's Park. Mm. Um, it's actually one of my favourite musicals, because it's, the, it's actually also one of the oldest musicals which is still regularly produced. If you take Gilbert and Sullivan out, out of the question, then what? The Showboat from 1926. Mm. There's Lady Be Good, which I think is 1924. I can't think of anything earlier than that which is regularly being performed. Anyway, they were, I'm, you, you, you've delighted me with what I've seen in Edinburgh, and I know you're going to delight me with what I'm going to see in London. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Blimey. Um, <laughs> well, good luck to you for the future, and I hope to hear more from you. Thank you so much for Play Parts. It's a five-star show. It's an exquisite little gem, frankly, and deserves to be seen much more widely. So uh, I hope that we all shall. I do too. Thank you. Musical talk. There we are. 
I very much enjoyed that conversation. It was nice to talk to someone about Paper Hearts because it was a show that I enjoyed rather more than I thought I was going to, in fact. And it's a show I'd very much like to see again here in London. And remember, that is possible for everyone because it's on at Upstairs at the Gatehouse, which is in Highgate Village, London, N64BD. And it's on Tuesdays to Sundays with no Monday performances, between the 2nd and the 20th of May this year, so from now. And if you miss it there, go and see it at the first stage in Hamburg between the 30th of May and the 7th of June. The important websites that you need to know are Upstairs at the Gatehouse, or one word, dot com, for booking tickets for its London run. And if you want to find out more about any other production, or hear the songs, or learn more about the creation of the show, then go along to PaperHeartsMusical.com. And although the show may be somewhat about broken hearts, I can assure you that Paper Hearts is in no way broken. It's an excellent show and well worth catching. Do go along to see it if you can. Well, that's it for this week. There's not much more to say, and therefore it would only be a fool who would carry on saying it. I hope not to be that person, so in order to prove it I'm stopping now, or very nearly now. When I'm actually going to stop is in just a second or two when I say the magic words. And here they are. Goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk, edited and presented by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2017. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our brand new website, musicaltalkpodcast.weebly.com or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can, at musicaltalkthos. But let's talk nuts and bolts first of all then. How can people who are in Edinburgh, sensible people, see it? Because, you know, when are you on... And how long are you on for? We are on at 6.40 at the Underbelly Med Quad. And we are on until the end of the run, so the 29th of August, I think is the last day. Oh, I think, I think you're the latest yet. I think mm. I, I, yeah, it's crikey, that is quite good there, right yeah. to the end of the month. Right to the end. We have one day off. Straight into hospital, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> straight into, yeah, straight into recovery of sleeping for a few weeks. Yes.